Gates now, member of the Armed Services and Foreign Affairs Committee, Congresswoman Tulsi, Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii. She was deployed to Iraq twice as part of the Hawaiian National Guard. Also with us, Republican Congressman Adam Kinziger of Illinois, who served in the Air Force in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And NBC News Justice Correspondent Pete Williams is at the table as well. Good to have you all. Congresswoman, let's start with you. You've had some pretty tough words about the illegal war against Assad. You said we must stop the illegal war against Assad. Explain. Well, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding and confusion. A lot of people, frankly, aren't aware that there are two wars that we're waging right now in Syria. The first one is against ISIS. This is a war that was off, uh, authorized after 9-11 against Al-Qaeda and uh, right. its affiliates, these other Islamic extremist groups. And this is a war that is within our national security interests. Mm -hmm. The second war is the war to overthrow the Syrian government of Assad. This is not a war that has been uh, authorized by Congress. Congress has not declared war against this sovereign government. And it's counterproductive to our first war to defeat our enemy because it's helping achieve the objective that ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and all these other Islamic extremist groups are trying to do, to take over right. all of Syria, to establish their Islamic caliphate, which would be disastrous in a humanitarian perspective right. and also a greater threat to the world. But, Congressman, can we have peace in Syria if Assad stays? No. No, no, and I mean, you know, with respect to my friend Tulsi, the idea of an illegal war against a dictator that his country is turning against, he controls 18% of Syria. Well, right shouldn't now. we declare war against Assad? No, because we're not engaged in active warfare. Are we maybe helping to train the opposition? Sure, we do that in a lot of places. It's the active warfare is, you know, we're, we're airstrikes against him. We dealt with that with the red line, which we made a huge mistake in not enforcing against Assad. But look, it, when all is said and done, if you want to fix ISIS, you have to fix Syria. Assad controls 18% of it. As long as he stays, there's no chance for hope in Syria. But and these it, groups rebel. Richard Haas, isn't that part of the problem, though, is that it is a two-front war, and we're not exactly sure where we stand against Assad being uh, driven out of power and where we stand on how aggressive we're going to be against ISIS. Uh, exactly right. We want Assad driven out of power, but not quite so quickly that there's a vacuum of power so that we could see in Damascus a version of what we saw in, in Lebanon. That said, he does have to leave power, but it's not going to be through an American act of war. That seems to me almost irrelevant. The only way he's going to be driven out of power is if his Alawite colleagues and the Iranians and the Russians want him pushed out of power. That's those are the people keeping him there. So it's, it doesn't require an act of war to see political change and transition in Damascus. The problem was that, is that as many backers show precious little inclination to pull to push him out. There is the larger question: How do we conduct a war in Syria under these circumstances? Because odds are, Joe, for the next couple of years. Assad could well be in power in an enclave that controls a fraction of the country. How is it we support Kurds? How is it we support the various Arab tribes? How do we go after ISIS and Nusra in that environment? What is our goal? What scale do we do it with? What role do others play? What's our definition of success? How fast do we try to achieve how much? And is that in any way necessarily supported by an act of war? That's the question about American strategy that I simply do not see being debated in this country. And um, uh, Pete Williams, we also obviously are going to have another debate in the, this country, and that is uh, where security concerns meet personal liberty. We had the battle after September 11th. Uh, and we're going to have it again now, uh, looking at some of these apps that are, are encrypted. What do you expect the 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 debate to look like in the coming months. It's been a sort of an evolution on this. You know, the FBI has been warning about this since May, about the possibility that uh, terror suspects are using these apps that you can download and put on your smartphone that provide what they call end-to-end -end encryption. You send a text message, it's encrypted from the moment it leaves your cell phone until it's received and read by the party you sent it to. And in the meantime, if the FBI comes and knocks on the door and says to WhatsApp or Threema or Telegram or any of these apps, hey, we have a court order here, we need to read what Joe is sending, that company can't do anything because it's encrypted. It can't even read it. Now, it, initially the FBI director has 
Bill Arm on this. Uh, he seemed to get some traction. The companies have been pushing back a little bit, but the administration has sort of backed off of a confrontational approach. It doesn't look like there's going to be any legislation right now. The administration isn't pushing it. So now what you hear from the Homeland Security Secretary and the FBI Director is, well, we're trying to talk to the companies. We're trying to work this out. We think that the atmosphere is better, better than when James Comey initially said, I have a huge problem with Apple's phones that, that even right. Apple can't unlock if you lock them. So I think the Paris uh, attacks, though, do shift the pendulum some, and perhaps it's moving a little away from uh, protecting privacy at all costs to look now at maybe there is some way to meet in the middle ground. I just want to say one other thing yeah, here. Sure. Uh, what the companies say is they don't want to provide a quote-unquote back door that shows the government this is all you have to do to get in. A compromise might be fine. Don't give it to the government. You keep it yourself if you're the app developer, and we won't use it until we have a court order, and then you give us the content. That may be a compromise. Andrew. I think Congress is going to jump into this because the administration didn't get anywhere. Congressional committees now want action. The intelligence committees are going to jump into this because they see a real problem. Diane Feinstein told yesterday congressman basically to get lost. Uh, she went to her own constituents in Silicon Valley <laughs> saying, I need help. Mm -hmm. yeah. We need need help. Uh, is, is Congress going to have to step forward? Yeah, but it's going to take private sector involvement. I mean, when we even tried to deal with this idea of private sector sharing virus threats or sharing, you know, internet threats with the government voluntarily, not forced, I mean, these privacy groups exploded and it became a huge political hot potato. The idea that we can now get to the point where we're going to be allowed to read encrypted text messages, I think it's going to be a big fight. It's it's a discussion we're going to have to have, though. It's going to be a big fight, fight because it's always that argument of the balance between civil liberties and national security and I think the the key to this is something that you mentioned is with cause if you have a court order if you have a, a valid reason to be able to try to get access to the information that's one thing versus the bulk gathering the, the gathering of, of information on all Americans whether it's emails or phone calls or who we're calling that's I think at the crux of this argument is with cause versus uh, gathering information on all Americans. Important to note here, though, that while we're having this discussion, we don't yet know if, in fact, the, the plotters in Paris used right. encrypted apps. We just don't know that yet. Uh, many law enforcement people have said they think it's likely, but we don't know it. These are people that were, some, there were brothers involved in this. They were, mm -hmm. they knew each other. So maybe they did the planning over the kitchen table. We just don't know that yet. All right. Tell Gabbard, Adam Kinzinger.